Um, before I introduce the speaker, I would like to say the land acknowledgments that um, we've agreed to say at our, our meetings here at our uh, the archaeological research facility is located in Wichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the art community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and the future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous people. And today, we are very pleased to have Professor Yanni Tamilakis, currently from Brown University. As I said, we've tried, what, two or three years now, I think it's been in the books, waiting for him to be able to come in person. So we're really, really pleased. Um, Professor Hamilakis received his BA at the University of Crete and his PhD at the University of Sheffield in England, where he continued on to teach at the University of Wales, Lampenter, and the University of Southampton in the UK before becoming the Jakowski family professor of archaeology and professor of modern Greek studies at Brown University in 2016. And those of you who know the history of archaeology know about Lampenter and Sheffield and how kind of hotbed of theory they were um, back when he was there. So it's quite wonderful to uh, have his history with us here today. Throughout his career, he's worked with many scholars in the field, laboratory, and in museums, including being the Wiener Lab Fellow at the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, a fellow at Princeton University, the University of Cincinnati, the Hafen Ruffer Museum, the Bard Graduate Center, the Remark Institute, and at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles, most recently. Dr. Hamilakis thinks and writes broadly, spanning topics such as sociopolitics of the past and the present, which we're going to get a taste of today. Archaeological ethnography linked to the archaeology of contemporary undocumented migration, which is movement of people from global south to the global north, as he says in his own writing. He also works on the archaeology of eating and drinking, again, his own words linked to the archaeology of the consuming body and of the bodily senses, as well as zooarchaeology. In essence, the archaeology of food, a topic of interest both he and I share. The ontology and materiality of photography, and I think we're going to see some of that today, and the archaeology and nationalism, which um, is part of his current recent, most recent book, which is quite wonderful. So um, I'm happy to share this with you. Um, later on, as well as critical pedagogy in archaeology. And this is represented not only in his many writings, but also in his classes that he teaches. He has been recognized in our discipline in many ways with honor, visiting faculty fellowship, keynote lectures. And from his list of these events, I've just chosen keynote lectures, and I found 19 on his list so far. And so this is your 20th. <laughs> So his publications are many, as I said, across all those topics that I listed for you. And that's not just one paper or one book or one article, many, many topics. He has 18 books, some single authors, some edited, some uh, special journal issues, and around 200 research articles. Again, not solely done as we do in archaeology, but with many other scholars as well. So I cannot comment on all these publications. But I do want to highlight several that I personally have found engaging and illustrative in our discipline, as well as suggesting and informing us on his active engagement with the public. And the first one that I remember very clearly was an uh, edited volume called Thinking Through the Body, Archaeologies of Corporality that he worked on and edited with Mark Kushiniak and Sarah Carlo. And some of us remember them being here on campus, Mark and Sarah, some years ago. Uh, another book he worked on, um, uh, published actually by himself in 2007, The Nation and Its Ruins, Archaeology, Antiquity, and National Imagination in Modern Greece. 
that won uh, the Edmund Keeley Book Prize in 2009. And in the same year, an edited volume with Phil Duke, they published a, a book titled Archaeology and Capitalism from Ethics to Politics. So you can see how his themes uh, occur again and again in different flavors. He's also published the provocative Archaeologies in the Senses, Human Experience, Memory, and Affect. And this most recent book, 2000, I'm not giving all the dates, but 2022, again, titled Archaeology, Nation, and Race, Confronting the Past, Decolonizing the Future in Greece and Israel. So it was a combination of two scholars. He wrote that with um, Raphael Greenberg. So his geographical focus is the Neolithic and Bronze Age of Greece and the Aegean, but he clearly is interested in archaeology of the contemporary, which spans a broader area. Because of this, in his practice and writing, Dr. Hamilaki recognizes the historically contingent nature of archaeology as a device of our modernity and its political nature that enables us to try and critique and be reflexive about the material world not only in the past, but in today. He currently directs, uh, I guess a long term, I say currently, but it's been some years now, at least 10, I think, a project at Cortrolo Magola, if I'm not saying that right, um, archaeology. It's an archaeology and ethnography project in central Greece that focuses on a Neolithic, a middle Neolithic uh, mounded or tell site, but he includes lots of other aspects to it, ethnography and also, which I hope we talked about theater archaeology. So maybe we'll find, you can ask me about it. So the point is there's many, many themes that we talked about. I'm going to conclude with three recent articles he's written just to get a flavor of his diversity. One published this year, Food as Affirmative by Politics at the Border, Liminality, Eating, Practices, and Migration in the Mediterranean, which of course represents his current ethnographic, archaeological ethnographic work. Second, also published this year, Border Assemblages Between Surveillance and Spectacle, What is Moria and What Comes After? Again, he's going to tell us about Lesbos um, and Moria. And third, this one, he's got to tell us about, A Handbook for a Haunted New Nomadic Age, Potential Material History. So it's a very provocative title. And I'm assuming it must all feed into the title that was up there and is not, but we'll come back. And his title of his talk today is also provocative, uh, New Histories of Humanity or Stories of Multi-Species Assemblages, Lessons from Neolithic Greece. So before I turn the stage over to Professor Yanis Hamilakis, I want to invite you all to a reception afterwards after he's spoken to us and you ask your questions, we can all share some food with him, both in the foyer and outside in front. So thank you very much for coming and please welcome Professor Tommy Lockies to our. Until we get this done, I want to thank you Christine, for this um, gracious introduction, very kind introduction. I'm very, very glad to be here, to be here with you. Um, uh, several years ago, Meg had invited me to give the spring lecture. Now I'm doing um, to speak with you twice, and perhaps I came another time to, to talk in your class, Christine, about food. So all very, um, you know, um, fond and happy memories from my time here. And I thank you again for, for this kind of invitation. What I'm going to try and do today is to give you a flavor of, of some of my current kind of occupations um, and thoughts. A lot of what I'm going to say, as uh, Christine mentioned, the site of Kutulumarula in Greece. But as you will see, I did not want to do a kind of a conventional presentation of an archaeological site. I thought long and hard on how do we actually talk about sites. And as you'll see, I am talking about the kind of the 
default mode of presenting science in a very stereotyped and very often very objectivist way. So that's one kind of concern, the site, and how can we talk about the site? But another concern is the recent discussions that were prompted and inspired by a book that many of you may have read, the book by the two Davids, David Wengro and David Greber, called The New, A New History of Humanity, The Dawn of Everything. So as you'll see, you have these two kinds of modalities, these two devices, a discussion on the book, from a critical point of view and a discussion on a small scale site in, uh, um, in this, this Italian plain. So um, how do we introduce an archeological site? How do we communicate to colleagues, but also to other interested people, our close encounters with specific materiality? Today, I want to talk to you about the third sites that have been excavating with many others, of course, in 2009 in the Thessalian plain in Greece. The site is, okay, it's not moving. <laughs> the site is called Kutrulu Magula. And Magula in Greece, in Greek, denotes a tail, a mound. Conventionally speaking, its main phase dates to the end of the early Neolithic and the start of the middle Neolithic, lasting for a couple of centuries in the transition from the 7th to the 6th millennium BC. It's a four hectare um, site, um, roughly twice as large as most Neolithic tell sites in Greece, rising about 6.6 .6 meters above the plain. Now the project is of course a collaboration project in many senses that one. There are many of us doing it and the credit goes to all our team. And it's also a collaboration in the sense that I'm doing this with the Greek Archaeological Service. My co-director is Dr. Nina Kiparizzi Apostolica. And in addition to two of us, we're also collaborating with Dr. Vasilis Tamis from UCL as a third collaborator. Dr. Kiparizzi started in fact uh, digging this site in 2009, and she invited me to join her in 2009. And since then, it is a, a shared endeavor um, under the Kutrulu Magula Archaeology and Archaeological Ethnography Project. So, we're about to launch this new website where you'll find lots of information and also all the different, um, different uh, publications. As Christine was saying, in addition to digging, in addition to ethnography, we also do a series of art projects, including, in fact, a theater archaeology project that aims to incorporate our archaeology and ethnography. A play is being written specifically for that year and for the site, and it's been performed often with the collaboration of people from the local villages on site next to the trenches. Now, despite my extensive readings and writings on sensoriality and affectivity, when I often talk about this site, I find myself trapped in a discourse that replicates the disembodied objectivist mode of being and doing archaeology. Even the most sophisticated, recent critical and interpretive um, attempts and accounts have not avoided that trap. To talk about theory more broadly, and when we talk about specific sites, to revert to that um, specific mode. I'm sure many of you know this feeling. So for today's talk, I have decided to do it differently, to introduce the site by citing passages from a book in progress on the philosophy of digging, inspired primarily by this site. Now, this may alarm some of you, but don't worry, there are going to be data, there are going to be scientific information alongside these kind of reflections on the philosophy of encountering sites like this. A second device, as I said, to come to my heart today, is a reflection on the new um, global history of humanity, the dawn of everything by the two David, David Greber and David Wengro, the book that we'll be discussing for some time and for good reasons. So from a small tell site in the Italian plain to the large scale global narrative and back. So the back and forth, I think, is quite key. So the vignettes on my own reflections on the philosophy of digging and some short interludes on the book. So you'll see uh, the jump from one to the next in a minute. 
my first vignette then. Called, it's called multi-species. So strange things happen every time we turn to this side to start our season. In the first um, two or three days, we're constantly encountering and disturbing non-human beings who meet beside their home. We're approaching and clearing away many plants, but also we are meeting lizards, frogs, slugs, beetles, crickets, um, rats, and snakes. They appear or jump out suddenly and unexpectedly, and they run across the field the other direction as we walk from trench to trench, and they climb on our trout. They must be quite annoyed, but they also must know that we are temporary guests and that the site will belong to them again in a month's time. We try to handle them gently. We move some of them out of the trenches and into the safety of the adjacent fields, knowing only too well that we are performing acts of displacement. But what about the animals that are not visible to us? The ones that they were hidden or had left the site before our arrival, the fields of which, or to put differently, the reshapings of the site are everywhere to be seen. What about the material places, or to put it more accurately, the material worlds that these beings have created? What about the fragile but ingenious architectonics of the spider's webs. These silky embodied entanglements that often make use of human architectures. And what about the holes, as in this case, often next to post holes or next to statues like a heart, like in this case. And finally, what about the domestic animals that occasionally find refuge at our side under our sheltered trenches, fleeing aggressive conspecifics or human brutality? Archaeological figure practices and discourses rarely turn to, to uh, their attention to these beings. They rarely, we rarely slow down to encounter them from up close. Archaeological tasks must proceed. Clearing and trench preparation will need to be carried out quickly, and our digging, sampling, and recording routines must progress steadily. Except when we are to attribute blame, to talk of the rats, the foxes, the badgers, the bees, as destroyers, as criminals who have committed the cardinal sin of bioturbation. Paradoxically, we are paying specific attention to the animals of the past, the material traces, just their bones, the human structures associated with them, even their manure, as we'll hear in a minute about this side. But not to the animals that inhabit and engage with our side today. We really stop to ask, along with Anna Chain, the question I quote, what manages to live in the ruins we have made? And for the, furthermore, what are these enduring lives are telling us about, um, about the world? Should we care to listen? We've been thinking this side since 2009, and our colleagues, as I said, since 2001, our colleagues in the UK Archaeological Service. And yet, in the last couple of years, it became clear to us that we live and work in a different moment. Things have changed. Our weather expectations do not hold anymore. Summer digging in the Mediterranean is no longer the same. Intense dry heat could give, away, could give way to lasting torrential rain from one day to the next and to humid, almost tropical conditions. Winters, at least in this part of the world, are also getting more severe. So while some of the species we encounter when I go, we go there every year, are the usual fauna of the area. Some others, including foxes and badgers, were not meant to be in that specific agricultural or archaeological landscape. But they are here for a reason, the disturbance of their own habitats due to the intense altering, exploitation, and commodification of the land. 
our ruins, our freshly dug deposits and profiles of her, um, in our sheltered trenches, allow them to live and to thrive of sorts, and they provide new spaces for an uneasy coexistence. In 2018, we published a scientific article as a team entitled The Neolithic Tell as a Multi-Species Monument. In there, we showed that domestic animals, sheep, goat, and cattle were living on site and they were even sharing elaborate buildings with humans. Even our largest building on site on the top of the tell, which is about uh, 80 square meters in area, um, and with walls that actually um, survive up to a meter and a half in height. So you can see um, this is, you know, the earlier phase, this one here. Um, under the you know the latest phase of the building this is another kind of this this is the large the largest building I'm talking about and maybe another slide to see the height of the wall that I'm, uh, I'm talking about so even this building housed at least for some time of its history domestic animals inside it so. Our working assumption is that this building is more likely community or assembly or of sorts at the top of the tail. If that is the case, and it is, it was a community or assembly hall, then that community that shared a building included both humans and non-human beings. Animals were fed on site and with the byproduct of crop processing, but they're also grazing um, in the fields nearby. To quote from that article, I quote, humans and animals live in the in close proximity, shared common spaces, and participated in the routine, reciprocal relations and interactions. Such close habitation and coexistence entails a dis distinctive sense of sensoriality, one based on the tactile, oral, and olfactory proximity to animals and other. Um, bodily functions and their bodily functions to animals and their bodily functions and the quotations. We then highlight in that article the sense of mutual care, mutual care between domestic animals and humans and think of you know, fostering strategies on site. And we concluded that, I quote, whatever the initial model of animal domestication, it seems that thousands of years after this process was completed, a pattern of cohabitation, commensality, and perhaps natural, natural, mutual and transcorporeal care involving humans and animals <coughs> who are still the norm in Neolithic communities. But we encounter non-human animals or non-human animals find us in other ways too. At least the idea of animality uh, is actually to be found in other in other forms and in other kinds of media. Take the case of clay figurines, for example, um, of which we have a very large number, more than 500 today. We archeologists often divide them into anthropomorphic and zoomorphic, and more recently talk also about hybrids between, uh, between the two. It is clear, however, that it is our anthropocentricity that drives that specific distinction definition, the anthropomorphic and the zoomorphic one. The first figurine to encounter when we went there, the new project in 2009, was this one we found over there on site, and you can see the, um, the photo here. And as you can see, um, it's a depiction not of an animal in the conventional sense, and not of a human in the conventional sense. It doesn't have, doesn't depict a human body nor an animal body. Over the years, we realize that while there are some clearly anthropomorphic figurines, some that they clearly imitate the pictal size of the human body, many, if not most of our figurines were depictions of beings that were beyond the category of the animal and beyond the category of a human body. And I want to show you some examples of what I'm saying. These are some of the ones that are actually very, very close to the human form. That's the you know, head here. Um, 
And here is another head with some sort of mask, the type that um, archaeologists who started to get into talk about, you know, perhaps a depiction of, of mask on the face. And of course, this one, which is from this year, um, a well-known type of a sitting female figurine. These are the um, ones that they clearly can be clearly described as anthropomorphic. But if you actually move on and examine several others, like this one, on which, um, by way, we spotted um, fingerprints, which we are now analyzing uh, in detail using um, various imaging techniques to actually understand the tactility process and the making process, but also perhaps start thinking about distinguishing um, age and gender on the basis of the fingerprints. Or this one, or this one, sorry, I have to run them, but you can, or this tiny one that, and I have another slide of this, that you can take a look and you can tell me well, what you see here being depicted. So many, I think, if not most of our collection of figurines depict completely fantastic beings straight out of the book of Louis Borges's book of imaginary beings. This large collection then um, invites us to rethink our categories of the human and of the animal in the uh, analysis of clay figurines. But to return, to return to more conventionally understood animals, we now realize that this site is a multi-species monument, hence the title in our, in our article, in more senses than we had originally thought. Their work on site, the animal work on site, their life with humans, their bodily presence, and their bodily excrement in the form of manure contributed to the gradual accumulation of the deposit, which became the tail. These beings are providing us with several philosophical, ethical, and political lessons. The multi species nature of past communities and of materiality past and present, the living properties of our field components and assemblages, constantly in flux, perpetually being transformed and the cross-species entanglements, alliances, and affective forms, which will have to foster and cultivate, especially in the era of anthropogenic environmental disaster. And now to shift registers, uh, and, uh, and my first interlude on the Dome of Everything, which as you'll see is in a dialogue with what I said. So, um, I don't know how many of you have read it, <coughs> but the dawn of everything is the fruit of a, of a long-term dialogue between the, between the anthropologist David Greber, the late David Greber, and the archaeologist David Wengro, which is, the book is barely one year uh, after its launch, and it's already, as you know, if you follow the press, a publishing phenomenon. Besides its commercial success, and not only in the English speaking world, I cannot recall another occasion in the recent or so recent past when a book written mostly for, for the general public has generated so much debate within the field, um, within the scholarly community. If this book is one thing above everything else, then it's a system systematic, well researched and relentless attack on teleological conceptions of history and on sociocultural evolution. Now, granted, within our community of archaeologists and anthropologists, these ideas have been heavily critiqued um, for many, many years now. But um, what these two scholars have done is to provide all the accumulation of all this evidence and do so in a very, um, um, in a manner that is extremely readable for the general public beyond, beyond the specialist. And um, let's, let's um, remember that despite our own critique, despite the kind of the, the epistemic critique of evolutionism, 
the terms such as bands, chiefdoms, and states are still with us. There are residual traces of that mentality, even in our courses very often. Often, of course, accompanied with the qualification that we do so for convenience purposes, for, for um, you know, for, for um, convention as opposed to kind of um, belief in the, in, the, um, in the kind of validity. So instead of linearity in this book, and determinism and hierarchy, we get playfulness, experimentation, and seasonal diversity, but also hierarchical social bonds, often defined by care, whether talking about the Neolithic revolutions that never happened or the emergence of the first cities. Now, to show that things have been otherwise or could have been otherwise, that things could have been otherwise, is what I consider one of the most fundamental roles of archaeology and anthropology in the present. And this book performs such role to show that things could have been otherwise admirably. Now, that things could have been otherwise also implies that things can still be otherwise. And here lies the second, even more important contribution of the book. At the moment of multiple crises, from private climate emergency to the virus of white supremacy and the various new fascism, fascisms. This book gives us not only scholars, but also the wider community license to imagine. Imagine different worlds, different configurations, different possibilities in the ongoing struggle for freedom. Indeed, while the obsession with origins in general and the origins of inequality in particular characterizes most, if not all, popular accounts about global histories, think of the various books and speculation, it is clear that the key concern in this book is not with inequality, but with freedom. They are not searching for past utopias to offer, offer them to us as models for the present and the future, nor are they looking, that is the authors, for anthropological and archaeological justification of their own political stances and convictions. They rather strive to convince that humans everywhere were always social and political agents, debaters, and philosophers constantly imagining and experimenting with a wide variety of modes of being and being communally despite what techno-environmental determinism, teleology, and the neoliberal Tina dogma, there is no alternative, would have us believe. As someone who, as Christian said, have been also working in the past few years with the people of the moon, on the border, and with contemporary migration, I was glad to see that the freedom of movement has been championed as one of the three main freedoms that the authors consider important in the past and the present. The other being the freedom to disobey and the freedom to imagine and construct different forms of social organization. For all that and for more, I think we should be grateful to the authors for such a gift. And yet, in the spirit of disobedience that the authors um, have actually championed, it is important to keep reflecting, reflecting on the underpinnings, the potential, the shape, and the blind spot of this endeavor, of this external endeavor. Global narratives of humanity is the germ that these actually these authors um, want to respond to, and the one that they have actually chosen to use themselves in this book although they are attempting to reshape that journey, to actually do it in a very different way. But what kind of tacit statements do the authors make when they open such a format for the global narrative, for the global history of humanity? What kind of authority are they involved in? And what are the implications for the politics of knowledge? This is a book that foregrounds local diversity, and champions the importance and impact of indigenous thinking, but it is written and published within the global north. 
and the voices of the global south are mediated by the authors, while contemporary indigenous thinkers are rarely discussed. As in any other attempt, such as this one, the difficult question is who has the right to invoke such a global panoptic vision? Who is entitled to tell the story of the whole world? And my question to the author, to the author, the survivor, to David Wenger, who, um, who had the chance to actually debate this book a few weeks ago at Brown as part of the conference. How can the next iteration of this project incorporate the diverse, unmediated voices from elsewhere, from the contemporary indigenous communities, which still produce orators and intellectuals? If this is a 700 year prolegomen into a larger project, which one hopes would be, how can that larger project become a collective and communal endeavor? within the active involvement and participation of communities from the global south. Furthermore, and here I come to my first vignette and the link to the um, what I'm going to say, is it histories of humanity we need today or histories of multi-species assemblages? In the times of climate emergency and of the moment when white supremacy is the weather, as the African-American scholar Christina Sharp has noted, but also several decades after the decentering of the abstract figure of the human in social and cultural thought, should we not go beyond anthropocentric narratives with their grounding in whiteness? The anthropos of the West modernity was the white human and most commonly the white male. Human. How can we, which is um, often involved in the dawn of everything. We often say we are stuck, we are this, we are the other. How can this we um, be expanded to include non-human beings? The world as we inhabit it has been co-produced by multiple sentient and non-sentient beings. That is this entangled story that we need to start telling more forcefully and systematically and in multimodal ways, beyond academic texts, uh, through images and multisensorial performances. So to my second vignette, um, again, uh, on the site, and that vignette has the title of uh, Polychrony, Anachrony, and Multitemporality. And by the way, this photo and many other so called artistic photos for this talk are by my collaborator and photographer and archaeologist, Otis Ipandidis. It is part of an artistic project that comes alongside excavation, ethnography, theater, and other things. So here he's there with that recording photographically facets that are not recorded by the standard um, device of photography as a, as a recording device in archaeology. They do not record, they evoke our presence there and now our kind of encounter with materiality. So if human beings, sorry, if non-human beings can be our philosophy teachers, can clay and store, so, sorry, can clay and stone and soil do the same for us, can they also be philosophy te teachers for us? It was the first day of our project in 2009. Um, and in our thread, which we call Theta 3, um, we cleared and prepared the ground for digging. We came to this site to continue excavating what we were told is a Neolithic site, a six millennium BC Neolithic tale. And yet, in the first 10 centimeters um, as we were digging, and well before we encountered the wall we were expecting to find, we found, we encountered a pot. Um, a vessel that comes, that is dated conventionally 5,000 years later, that is a late Bronze Age, a second millennium BC drinking cup, the Kylix, for those of you who know, you know, the Bronze Age archaeology of the Aegean. It was duly recorded and bad and was forgotten. And we um, returned to, um, to our trench and soon enough we found, we found the Neolithic wall we were expecting to find. And yet, 
that moment, the moment of fighting that Kylix came back to Honda several years later, in 2011 and 12, we in fact encountered and excavated a whole complete late Bronze Age Holocene. Next to the Neolithic uh, building. So here is again a Holocene, you can see it's on the same level as the ne so called Neolithic houses we are actually excavating. In 2011, uh, we also encountered a, a, a burial here, which is where the Holocene is, this is where the burial is a burial of a woman, which was dated to the 11th century CE of the common era, right? So again, several thousand years later. So you could say, so what? This is a multi-period site. This is, you know, there are so many of them, a multi-period site and nothing else. Only that that label, a multi-period site, is inscribed within our modernist understanding of time as linearity, as succession. It results from a synoptic view of material history, seeing everything together, the synoptic view, and an act, a teleological understanding of temporality. While these stones and other materials appear to us today as belonging to different moments in time, they can in fact be treated as materializations of duration. As with all material entities, duration would have been their primary and fundamental property to recall the philosopher Bergson here. As such, they would have enacted time as multi-temporality, not as succession. The stones from the Neolithic buildings would have continued to live and act upon the world in the second millennium BC and in the 12th century AD or C. In fact, it could be argued that it was their living agency, their continuous presence that attracted the people in later periods to the site. While the mnemonic power of the site is often invoked when such later finds are encountered, it is clear that something more is happening here. Returning the dead to a place, remember these are burials, both the Bronze Age one and the medieval one. And returning the dead to a place of mnemonic value seems appropriate, of course. But while digging for those burials, people would have encountered the material presences which we now classify as Neolithic. Think of the Bronze Age person digging to build this Holostone in a Neolithic kind of context, Neolithic site. They would have, in other words, entered into a dialogue with such material presences. They would have perhaps repurposed and reused some of them, some of the Neolithic um, stones or other material traces, giving them new lives and adding to their multi temporal histories. Even, uh, even um, the soil, the stone, and the clay features, which we now date strictly as Neolithic, such as these walls here from these buildings, teach us that our chronometric thinking is out of sync with the material realities on the ground. Pit digging, for example, digging pits disturbs the layers, as we know, bringing forth concealed matter while in entering, while inserting into its earliest, um, earliest strata new material. You dig, you encounter, um, you know, earlier things, but you also insert into the pit things that come from another, from another <coughs> moment. Earlier walls, as we know, are often robbed for stone material, which is incorporated into subsequent building faces. And the red clay from burned strata in Neolithic settlements is dug up and used as bonding material in subsequent walls made of white limestone. So look at the bonding material here on this wall, the very, very bright red, which comes from the burned structures, the earliest structure people disturbed to build this space. And, and think of the contrast between the white soft limestone and the very bright burned clay as a bonding as a bonding material here, especially if we assume that these walls were left uh, with no um, other kind of um, cover outside. So this, these are things that to us speak not just of functional processes of reuse, but also kind of a multi-temporal dialogue with different materials. You can think of different poetic and other expressions that actually talk about this phenomenon. Think of Shakespearean times out of joint, or think of 
Faulkner says phrase, the past isn't dead, it is not even past. These materials resist our attempts to meet chronological categorization and placed into doubt our modern um, certainties on the linearity of time. You could think philosophically, as I mentioned already, Bergson, but also the late on duration, or even Nietzsche and his notion of the untimely, the untimely that acts counter to our present moment, counter to our time. But perhaps you can also think again philosophically to stay with the Western tradition, um, Derrida and his notion of hauntology, hauntology, both haunting and ontology, the ghostly presence of life past, but which are still not completely past yet, and it will forever haunt us. A disturbing ontology of time that demands to be taken seriously. And of course, before, very often before these Western philosophers, indigenous thinkers in this land and many other lands have spoken about the past as alive, about haunted matter, about the land as living history. There are so many um, references we can think of here. So allowing stones and clay and pits to become our philosophy teachers requires attending to their own sensorial contemporaneousness, demands a process of attunement, attunement with the side and the stones and the clay. And this is a part of the embodied immersion and acclimatization to the material and sensorial realm of the side, a sensorial education that we all have to go through every time we return to the side. You may have noticed it yourself in your own side. It takes a few days and weeks to become attuned to the materiality of the place. Um, and it's education we need to um, go through again and again every time we return to the field or to the site. So my um, second interlude returning to the dawn of everything briefly. What is the conception of temporality that we actually use the two Davies in this book? Well, as I said, this is an anti-progressivist, almost Benjaminian manifesto, but one that goes along the archival grain in the sense that it followed the temporal regime of modernity and the theological chronometry of the modern era, the Ans Domini. But what if? This book was instead to abandon the distinction between past, present, and future as stable grounds and speak of their fragility and um, indeterminacy. What if the authors were to accept that several archaeologists, anthropologists, and now some historians are suggesting that, and I quote a historical um, reference here, I'll say the minute what it is from, that what we usually call the present is merely a fragile consensus. That phrase stuck with me, a fragile consensus, a silent clash. This is by a book by Edward Stein, Whitley, and Gerulanos called Power and Time, published two years ago. An explicit dis discussion on temporality as the experience and perception of time and of historicity, not as facticity as they discuss in the book, but as different conceptions of history would have enraged the arguments of the book. It will perhaps expose not only the nexus of um, time and power, but also the simultaneous coexistence of different and often clashing temporal regimes in each context. Indeed, from the dawn's list of the source of social power and domination, which are sovereignty and the use of violence, one, charisma, the second, and the control of knowledge, the third, what is missing is chronopolitics. Time as memory and as historicity, which can become a political resource, can become a resource of social power in each context. This is not listed in their own source of social power, although occasionally they do talk about the use of the past and the present. We turn to the signs for our next vignette, and now the next vignette is devoted to water. Water. So we have been reading 
the signs for some time now. The Neolithic inhabitants of this place had a special relationship with water. At the beginning, it was the residues that were finding on bones and on shirts, the sandy residues, the gaining substances that resisted our attempts to remove it, despite the hard work, despite our strong brushes, our rigorous back and forth. Then there were the um, archaeobotanical and zoarchaeological, especially the microphonal reports, talking of the hydrophilic plants and animals of reeds and also of river clans, of, um, of, of amphibians and water snakes. For example, this um, shell spe species called Crassus crassus, which lives in riverbeds and was dug by people from the riverbed and was in the, you know, taken back to the, to the site. And finally, there were the construction works the water sculpted stones, some of them which so earlier, the soft limestone that clearly had kind of signs of kind of water action around them, but more so the extensive perimeter ditches that we saw first in the geophysical work, as in the magnetometer survey here, and you can see the, the wide concentric surrounding linear features that we interpreted as as ditches, and here's the interpretation of the geophysics. You can see these going all over the tail, several layers, several kinds of uh, circles around the, the tail itself, and which we finally, a couple of years ago, located and ground to archaeologically through our digging when we found uh, um, one of those um, ditches here, and you can see a few more or slides of it. This is a, a photogrammetry. Um, kind of rendering, and here you can see also the you know the bottom of it, but also notice the stepped entrances into the ditch. This ditch, by the way, was about four and a half meters wide and about a meter and a half deep from the assumed surface of the Neolithic level. And pe clearly, people wanted to have access to the bottom time and again, it wasn't that once and then abandoned. So that is quite interesting. Here's another um, photosis kind of artistic photo of excavating in that um, specific ditch. Alyosha, by the way, was one of the excavators in the team a few years ago. Yeah, especially that it did work. So um, these perhaps were attempts to contain water, but also to avoid flooding. And perhaps also to preserve and store it, hence the kind of step access to the ditch to actually retrieve water back and dig for clay, I'm sure, for other kinds of material. And what about our more recent find, a rare um, pottery workshop, six millennium BC pottery workshop? And you can see, um, I'll run a couple of images and I'll talk about it. Here is kind of this is the clay wall of the workshop, and here is one of the best is there pottery kilns of the site. And here is um, a close up of that specific kiln. You can see its wall. This is the kind of the floor of the kiln, a pottery kiln. We found lots of um, misshaped pots nearby as well. Forming was happening there as, as well as kind of a firing of those pots. And this specific workshop was found here at the periphery of the tail, very close to the ditch, very close to the sources where water could have been preserved and stored and perhaps retrieved for some of the pottery making processes. And of course, 8,000 years later, here we are again in the, on the same site and water is for every year a major feature in our lives in many ways. On the first day of the dig and after a year's absence, we arrived to find some of our trenches, of course, flooded, the soil all over and soft, moist, and damp and muddy. Our, lo our um, lowest trench, um, the trench of the ditch, was um, you know, completely um, covered with water. And bailing our water was one of our tasks for, for days before we were able to dig. So 
In the following days, we would enter into a dialogue with this specific substance, with this uh, greenish and brownish murky substance, you know, with stagnant water. We could bail it out every morning, only to realize, especially in the ditch, that will come, it will come back again through the night. You know, table water will actually, the water from the water table will actually enter the ditch again. But even um, on the slope, um, of the trench, not just on the ditch, the green and even patches on our vertical profiles, our stratigraphic protoflora spanning hundreds of years in stratigraphy offer another testimony to the presence of water. The British poet Alice Oswald says that she likes water because of its falling qualities and its ability to rise again. She likes it also because it does not like it so orderly, because it can pass like an apparition without the trace, she said, without trace. Well, without the trace, as archaeologists, we know that that's not the case. Water has left, leaves plenty of traces here on this site and on many other sites. It transformed our site, made it a fluid terrain, a constantly shifting materiality. Water transformed our digging too. Water slowed us down. Water made us struggle with mud as we attempted to sieve the soil, as we spent endless hours taking handfuls of soil in our hands, squeezing it with hidden artifacts, kneading like a like a dog, as we as we're kind of um, as if we were preparing clay to make pots. But Oswald is right about another thing, about order and disorder. Water mocks our attempt at ordering the materiality of the site, belies our effort to impose a certain, even temporary stability. We are forced to go with its flow, its temporal logic, its liquid um, thinking. We are forced to listen, as in many other, as in many, um, raining digging days as we gather under the polygated iron of the shelter and waiting for the, the rain to pass and would listen that characteristic rain falling on metal. We were forced to smell it as it dampened the, uh, the wheat and the cotton fields around us. We were forced to respond to it as we were constantly cleaning our muddy box. It rearranged our sensorial field. It assembled multiple co-presences. It brings us face to face with creatures, beings, things that we'll never encounter, we'll never have encountered otherwise. Water teaches us humility. So this I will pass. A very short interlude returning to the dawn of everything. Time as embodied material memory is experienced and activated through the sensorial attention to matter, through the sensorial and affective affordances of elements, things, places, and environments. Despite the plethora of archaeological examples, I wish the dome of everything was more archaeological in the sense of a detailed appreciation and analysis of the physicality of matter and its sensorial properties, perhaps focusing on fewer examples as opposed to the many hundreds of examples that there are in the book. Such an appreciation and thus multi-temporal experiments of matter, time as a sense, and matter as engendering sensoriality, duration would have enriched the book. Now, references are made, of course, to sensoriality in the book, but as practices of communal feasting. But as we know, this, the, the category of feasting has been framed in many different ways in archaeology, and very often it is used within the teleological thinking that the authors won't counter and, and, and overcome. So what is missing is not genetic discussions about feasting, but specific discussions on eating, drinking, other sensorial practices, and the physical and sensoriality of, of matter, the possibilities that are engendered and the anarchic character of sensoriality. And I want to um, approach the close of my talk.
by returning to the site and more specifically the community that we work with, the human community work with on site. My next vignette is called Affect and it's the more personal one. It was again 2009, the first season of our field project and the first night in the village in the middle of uh, this Thessalian plain in Greece. We are sitting on a long table in the taverna, all the students and staff together, and all we get to start our project, the first night in the village. We were full of anticipation, but also a kind of concern on how the community are going to, to receive us. An elderly man on the next table was drinking his beer pensive, but clearly attentive to our presence. We exchanged a few words, he asked a few questions, but then he suddenly disappeared. A few moments later, he returns, he comes back holding a violin. He started playing for us, and the music lasted for the rest of the evening, transforming our first anxious night into a memorable occasion. I learned later that this um, or gentleman was a, a migrant from Bulgaria, part of the Greek-speaking migration of people from Bulgaria to the Greece in the 1910s and 20s. Was well known in the area and beyond. He had traveled widely, he had performed his violin in many different places in the country and beyond Greece. It was, uh, it was a few years later in one of our subsequent seasons when Stamatis, the name of the violin player, had passed away, that I met Calliope. Calliope, his partner in life and music, his muse, it seems, the singer in the duetto, and the diva and a diva on her own. She loved me and I loved her. We want to use, we went to see her tonight. I'm writing on this in a moment. In a moment. That youthful, this youthful 80 year old had already narrated her long and eventful life to me in our previous years. It's a long story. Child of top communist partisans, she was left behind when the parents crossed the border to the socialist republic and socialist republics at the end of the civil war, a tragic moment in, in Greek history. She survived. She thrived. She loves Tamaris and she loved music. I sing on my own. I sing all the time, even in my sleep, she told me tonight. One time, a couple of years ago, she brought um, out, she brought out out of her, you know, back room, the traditional costume of, costume of Stamatis, the one that uh, was brought from Bulgaria. She wanted me to wear it. She wanted me. She wanted to see me in Stamatis' clothes. She wanted to see that costume worn in feasts and celebrations by, by her beloved husband come alive again. She sang for me that night. I told her about Stamatis in the first, the first encounter, the first night in the village. As a migrant, she understood strangers, she told me. We drank together, we laughed and we cried, and then I left. And I was leaving, I remember that this woman had the name of my mother, and if she was alive, she would have been of a similar age. Kayop invited me to her sonorous memory scale. She's one of my philosophy teachers. Every time we meet, she teaches me the affective archaeology of being in the world. She explains to me the sensorial constitution of life of memory. She instills in me the art of what our colleague at Stewart calls the ordinary affects, ordinary affects. Things happen in that in-between space, neither mine nor hers, a space structured by our embodied lives, the zipper that we are actually drinking, the small courtyard with the flower pots, and the space structured by the singing, by her tales, by her memories. Our shared philosophical understanding is grounded, grounded on sonority, on the history of popular singing and music, 
that connects her with Stamatis many, many years after his death. Her philosophical lesson is one of what Stephen Feld has called acostemology, not epistemology, but acostemology. I sing even in my dreams, she said, reminding me. So our lives are detected because of the dig. The sight of Kutiluma Ula brought us together. Calliope is a keen participant in the theatrical performances we stage every year next to the open trenches. She has never read Spinoza, but she has recognized our desire to enact an affective archaeology, which is still, which includes her too. And she's determined not only to fully participate in that affective space we are creating, but also to teach us how a philosophical poetics of affect should look like. And I want to finish now with two sentences. I've spoken long enough and with no food, no drink, and no singing. <laughs> so um, I have learned what I've learned from the dawn of everything and from the plants, the, animal, the animals, the clay, the stone, and the water in our site, and from my friend, dear friend Kayobi, is first that global histories cannot replace small scale, detailed, and finely textured, affective and sensorial accounts of matter, time, and affectivity. That an attack on teleology, developmentalism, and progressivism can be much more effective and effective, of course, if it unsettles the whole terrain of modernist temporality, the notion of archaeo in archaeology, I think of it as saying, the fragile consensus we call the present. And finally, that rather than harking back to notions of humanity, we should conceive of locally grounded but globally impactful communities, communities of care and affect. Communities that include multiple species of sentient beings, non sentient entities. The assemblies that we were talking, we were taking place in the assembly houses, one of the hypothetical examples I showed you, seem to have been made not just of humans, but of other beings, too, including domestic animals. These are the communities that I encounter in the multi temporal Neolithic. And these are the lessons that they've taught me and I've tried to convey to you today. Thank you very much. And apologies for the long talk. Thank you. That was wonderful. So uh, if you're willing to have some questions or comments, would you please repeat them back so that it they get recorded. Yeah, sure. So when they get of course. I know it was long, so I apologize. And I'm sure you need a couple of minutes too. Thank you. Um, as usual, first of all, thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to cover so much ground. And then you focus a little bit mm -hmm. and then you move on. So we're left seeing folks oh, here and there. Yeah. Which is great because we all need that. Um, and of course, thinking about your starting, how do we represent archaeology? How do we represent the sites that yeah. we work at? Mm -hmm. This is, of course, a very important question that we're struggling with these yeah. days because the, the old ways, so to yes. speak, of doing are. Yeah. Um, this is problematic in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. So the question is, and I know you've published one article, but how do you incorporate this into a way of presenting it to a wider audience um, mm -hmm. than this group here mm -hmm. or a journal article here or there? How do you mm -hmm. take this embodied, yeah. emotional, mm -hmm. um, deeply connected to the site, to the experiences mm. uh, that you and others have had there. And how does that get communicated? How do we make archaeology more, as, um, as you know, yeah. uh, from the heart yes. um, than from the from yeah. objective facts that yeah. we're, we're yeah. demanding to produce? Okay, for the benefit of those who are on Zoom, my good friend and colleague, McConkie asks me, how do we communicate this 
vision of archaeology to people beyond academia, I guess, and beyond our circle of colleagues uh, in archaeology? How do we convey that archaeology of the heart? Because, well, that's, that's the struggle we are facing. And rather than kind of agonizing on the hand about this, I'm thinking of the different scales with our work. So for me, the communication um, to the immediate uh, to the people who are living on around the site next to us is our first goal. So that's you know, hence of those projects I mentioned briefly here, but had no no uh, time to elaborate on. So I was saying with Christine earlier that we of course do the conventional site tours every year and they do the open days and they do all that, but that's clearly not enough. You know, we shouldn't assume that if we take people on site and say, all these things that would immediately, um, hence the art projects, hence the attempt, the theater to perform the site, to perform the archaeology of art or the archaeology of art to another medium that is not conventionally used by archaeologists. It's a lot of effort and work on all our part. Our colleagues, our colleague who is in charge of the theater archaeology project is a professional actor, also has a degree in archaeology. And he comes, and sometimes brings other collaborators. So they come and dig with us. Uh, and they then write the play as they dig and as they communicate with the community. So they do some ethnography uh, in the evening. So they dig in the morning and they write a play that would connect with some of the realities in the villages, as well as some of the realities we are actually uncovering on site and make that a thematic short but I think very um, effective and effective performance and then ask some of the people from the village to also be the actors that will co-produce the performance next to the churches. So that's I think a, a specific way we are actually using in that you know level at that level the scale of the community around around the site. But the plays, some of the plays have then moved elsewhere. So the first stage performance had as a theme food. It was so, so successful on site and there were invitations by colleagues in other places to actually stage it in more conventional spaces, next, not just next stretch, but also in um, restaurants, in art museums, in art performance. So that trans transported some of the materiality of the site in another, another locality, in other occasion, in other audiences. As for how we do it in kind of the broader community, broader world, this is, these are still things that we are um, thinking and experimenting at the moment. We are thinking that artistic photography is another key with us, why I keep collaborating with Photoshop and Davis, and we are hoping to produce more works that rely on this photography, some of which we saw here. And the website is going to be another, but and this is a kind of a confession that I have to make, and uh, perhaps you can help me. I'm still struggling. I know that um, Ruth has done a lot of work on how actually to do that in terms of final publications, what you do when you want to put the site together as a final excavation report. And I don't want to do the conventional one, but I'm thinking, trying to think of alternative ways and I've learned from some of your experiments. This is still an ongoing discussion I have with my team. Um, so I would say, the short answer is multimodal performances on site and elsewhere beyond the text. So I, I always recommend not so traditional site reports that grow in Europe here and her book in Tokyo. Yeah. Which is really, you know, something I need to go back to. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing that, you know, sort of hangs over her is the academic reward system. That's right. And, you know, how you young scholars um, adopt and get engaged in these kinds of ways. Um, but that's why we are keep, you know, we keep publishing our conventional academic scientific right. articles. These need to be out and these need to be out, as you say, primarily for the benefit of our junior colleagues who have to publish in those forums. But then alongside those, I think we should continue doing all the other stuff. Which means that the camp is now doubled. It's doubled, it's more yeah, time consuming, and the final publication takes much longer. <laughs> yes, right. Hi. Yeah. I'm in Spoiler, and I'm 
I, I think like this is a little bit familiar from like my own field of knowledge and from the let's say the shift in the um, in the knowledge making machinery to that academy and also public engagement has taken over our field in the last uh, decade or two. Be it uh, the history of the uh, materials and animals and the uh, yeah. domain yeah. and of space. And I can still actually really realizing this very much mm. in your own work about the type and other. Mm. My suggestion from another similar college and also a member of the like, is perhaps not to try to tell one story, but to focus on comparing and contrasting different narratives of the site. We can have the volume that tells the site for many different yeah. narratives. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, under the understanding that no one will be completed. Of course. Uh, no one is only relevant for a certain group of people. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Of course. I mean, the question is, our uh, suggestion is, in order to you know achieve that kind of scope of integrating these different angles, is to produce different narratives, not to our interpretation, but different. Some of the traditional sciences, especially traditional archaeology, or the last generation, have been very or more, allows us to many new complaints which couldn't tell before and are published in Nature or any other science uh, journal. For yeah. example, people discovered in Jerusalem, they found vanilla in all these kind of uh, wine jars. Nobody thought uh, that this uh, sort of, uh, let's say, of uh, pipes were available. And they started to tell this in many different uh, ways. So again, there's a story, let me show you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the soil, the land, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Um, so what are you what you're suggesting? I think is happening already, and we have very, very good science journalism journalists who do that. But I am saying that we need to 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 try harder to go beyond the sense of these stories being just human stories or stories spoken uh, and written exclusively from the point of view. Of the human. I was critiking the anthropocentrism of much of archaeology, but also of other disciplines. And I was saying, what would it mean to write a, a multi-species history of night? What would it mean to write a multi-species history of site like this? Yeah, beyond talking about animal bones within a discourse of subsistence, exploitation, um, or other kind of mode that we often animal husbandry we often use in archaeological narratives. How can we say, okay, these were co-producers of the site. These entities, these beings, they sh shaped and shaped the site. So it's not the site of human, the site of many different beings. Let's write that story as a story of multi-species yeah, monument. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a way which is not a sort of sterile academic publication, print publication. Is there some is there some way how you imagine something? I mean, your your lovely the lovely book or book you are yeah. talking about yeah. said, yeah, imagine a different life. Yeah. But can you imagine a different way? Just just you know, be safe. Yeah. So people. The question for, for the Zoom audience by the thing from another great friend of mine and colleague is how how do we do this practically um, beyond the conventional archaeological text? So in the book that I have some vignettes from, uh, that book is not going to be a conventional archaeological text, I hope, because the style of writing is not a conventional archaeological style of writing. It's not a report on the site, it's not even a popular account of the sign is a, you could call it creative nonfiction if you want. Uh, it is a kind of a reflection that is deliberately written um, in a different, hopefully more engaging style. It will include also literary passages, will include other forms, and hopefully will have also visual components to accompany that kind of different style of writing. But you have experimented with many different forms, Ruth. Yeah, I don't know the answer myself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a constant struggle, but I think we, we, I mean, as we know, anthropology is going through its multi modal moment it right now. Be, it has to be multi modal. Yeah. yeah. So that you can bring in the, the imagined, the animals or whatever they're doing. 
if you kind of mesh them all together. Absolutely. I'm, I'm still doing a, I'm Absolutely. I mean, uh, the web publication is something you pioneer in relation to Neolithic sites and other things. So the online publications offers more possibilities in terms of that multi-modality. So this is something that we, we want to experience. But I still believe that the text itself can be done differently. So we have on our minds the dry text of our conventional archaeological report. But if the text is not that, and it's, a, it's something that evokes affectivity, evokes new text and sociality, so a combination of image and text in a different manner can be extremely powerful too. So, I hope. <laughs> Let's see. Just so uh, I just wanted to add in because we were alternating between yeah. the two Davids. Yeah. I might use that briefly. Yes. And then your work. Yeah. What has the the two Davids have have a new way of looking at the larger picture? Yeah. How has that engaging so much intensively with that book and the author mm. of that book mm. been able to move you towards these other ways of Engaging with and presenting for ourselves. I mean, you gave us vignettes, but mm. I've never, I mean, yeah. you haven't written, you yeah. didn't want to share it really with us. Yeah. There's something that you haven't said yet that really gives you new insights yeah. into how to present mm. your data. Mm. From them. Or you mm. wouldn't be bringing that in. Well, I, I mean, I, I read the book a um, couple of times in the last year or so. Uh, we had that conference. I'm still digest, so just to, for, the, for the Zoom audiences. The question uh, is, how do how does the book, the Dome of Everything I discussed here, uh, has reshaped the way I deal with the site, uh, the site, our own site, the Kapriluma Wola site, how that book has shaped and kind of reshaped our interpretation of it. And I'm saying that I'm still digesting that book and I'm still kind of re reflecting through the kind of ideas and modes. But what one way um, that I tried to convey here, perhaps not so successfully, is to um, try and merge the micro scale of the Neolithic side with the globe or the bigger scale or the global scale that I'm actually saying. Trying to think, is there still scope to, of how can we do that? For example, as I said, one of the criticisms I have of the book is that partly because of its global coverage, the many archaeological examples that they use are not really sensorial enough, are not archaeological enough, are not finely textured to involve that power of materiality that I hope I would have probably really done. And that's something that I think can be done once you focus on the side. Um, that's one way. A second way is to rethink more of kind of the sense of the so-called assembly houses or community houses. A key device in the book is, let's say, in the Ukrainian mega sites, the presence of assembly buildings. In many other sites, you know, buildings that are central to a community and they are not meant to be habitation buildings, but buildings where gatherings were taking place. As I said, we have a building such as my possible assembly house. But I wanted to rethink of that idea by Bringing in the multi species angle, I'm trying to actually say, because what I'm seeing is that building that they were not a conventional gathering place for humans allow. If you are, if you have your sheep and the goat and the cattle and the humans in the same space and you all assemble in the same very elaborate building with stone walls, uh, you know, one meter and a half or two meters high, it means something else. It means that for them, community did not mean just human community. For them, community means also the animals together. So that's another way that actually that book helped me to, to reshape. So it was both a deep appreciation of, of the, the mission of the book, and at the same time, some concerns that I think need to be voiced as a kind of attempt to take it with us and go beyond it and actually do the next, the next thing. I don't know if it answered some of it, but you're right. I mean, another talk would be kind of, okay, now let me tell you, the story of this side based on my completely thinking. That will wait for a few yeah, years. Have, well, I know it's fit and, and we're all still digesting it, but it, it, I think attempted to really bring in a different perspective on human existence yeah. in terms of from a, a, an indigenous Absolutely. point of view, a non yes. European, yes. non Western point of view. Yeah. You're working at a site that's in the European tradition, so yeah. you're sort of allowed to use the European 
traditions, but should you try and feel that back and have it a different of, of, of intellectual or ontological well my good friend Calliope is my indigenous person my indigenous interlocutor she lives in the land and she has a philosophy about life and about beings and about past history stones that I have so much to learn from that's why I made her a central figure in my talk today I will continue hopefully continue talk to her for many years so yes there's not conventional sense of indigenous groups in the sense that we know from this country or other parts, but there are people who have lived in those sites for many generations. And they have their own sense of temporality and materiality that are considered extremely important for us to learn from 